So it's um, Father's Day today, and I, I thought about uh, I thought about preaching a Father's Day sermon because I preached a Mother's Day sermon. I thought, well, that would only be fair to preach a Father's Day sermon. But a, as I was praying, I, I just felt God wanted me to continue this morning in my 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 sermon series in James for this for this day. So we're actually going to be wrapping up uh, the book of James in in the series. And today we've come to the very last portion of the last chapter in, in chapter five of verse of of the book of James, and um, so we see this letter um, that James has been giving uh, practical advice to people on how they ought to carry themselves as believers. As said before, um, James is like the wisdom literature of the New Testament. So um, let's just bow our heads as we uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon his word. Jesus, we thank you that you give us your word. Your word is truth. We can depend upon it for guidance in our lives. And Lord, as we go through your word this morning, I pray that you'd, you'd just open our hearts to hear what your spirit would say. And God, that you give me the words to say that it can be articulated in the way that honors you and directs people to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the text this morning is um, James uh, chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. And my message this morning is about healing and restoration. So that being said, let's, let's uh, turn to James 5, and we'll start with verse 13. James says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. So in every circumstance in life, James encourages his readers to turn their faces towards God in prayer. And the world is full of trouble and trials of a, a diverse kind, right? You guys all experience it. There's trouble in this world. Some of the trials and Hardships we face are physical trials. I just had a, had a week here where our sister, Sheila Waite, um, was suffering through cancer and heart issues. And spending some time with her this week, she wasn't doing all that well, and, and she ended up passing away this week. So she's no longer here in this world. But, you know, we had a really good talk before she actually went unconscious this week about heaven, and, and God put it on my heart to, to share with her heaven and, and what, what greatness awaited. You know, the, it's, it's beautiful. But, you know, in the midst of our trials, God gives us encouragement. And, and he says here in the book of James, if you're troubled... If your heart is weary, if your burdens are too much for you to bear, cast your cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. Come to the Lord in prayer. We can be confident that nothing escapes the gaze of our Father. And in every circumstance in life, we're called to turn to Him in prayer. Well, someone might ask this question, though. Well, if God is control of every, in control of everything um, and in control of human history, knowing absolutely everything before it happens, then uh, what's the point of praying? If he knows the end from the beginning, what's the point? The an answer actually lies in understanding the nature of prayer. If we see prayer as only a means of taking some level of control over our lives in this world by leveraging God, leveraging Him to give us what we want, what we ask for, then we are inevitably going to be very troubled. We're going to be troubled and disappointed by what appears to be unanswered prayer. The raw reality of it, folks, is there's times, and a lot of times, that God says, no, that's not my plan for you. Or 
Maybe the timing isn't right. You need to wait. But God ultimately knows what we need before we pray. So when we pray, we're connecting with Him and we're aligning ourselves with Him and we're submitting ourselves to Him and we're looking to Him as the author and perfecter of our faith without which we are absolutely lost. Amen? So when we pray, we're coming to God and we're, and we're coming into agreement with the Spirit of God. In reality, there's, there is no unanswered prayer. We just, not, we just might not get what we think we need. But God ultimately knows what we actually need. He might actually choose to give us something different in a different way than what we asked for. And God doesn't always remove the trouble. Sometimes He does. I've had circumstances, and maybe you have in your life, where you've prayed and God has delivered you miraculously from something. And maybe sometimes you pray and He allows you to go through the fire. But He always promises that He'll be with us no matter what occurs. He gives strength to us to endure trouble when it comes. It's written concerning the strength that God offers His children in Isaiah chapter 40. In verses 28 to 31, Isaiah says this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and the young men stumble and fall, but those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen. So cast your cares upon the Lord. He cares for you. And He'll meet you right where you are with exactly what you need. And when we're happy, James says that it's good for us to lift our voices in praise to the Lord. Isn't it good when we come together corporately and we can sing songs of praise to the Lord? It's good for us when we're happy to, to raise our voices and to praise Him. God deserves all of our praise, doesn't He? He does because He's much greater than anyone can understand. And even if God never did another good thing in our lives, we could spend the rest of our life praising Him for what He's already done. Amen. You see, David was a man after God's own heart. And one of the things that David understood, he understood the principle of praise very well. There's so many references to praise in the book of Psalms. David understood the nature of God. He knew that God was sovereign over all and he was worthy of praise. And, and he had it right when he wrote in the book of Psalm 150, verses 1 to 5, 6, he says this, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and with the pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Or when David sings in Psalm 113, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you, you His servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted above all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? The one who sits enthroned on high. Wow. Wow. Isn't it just reading the scriptures, the heart of David flowing forth? When we're filled with happiness, the default of our heart ought to be 
to praise the Lord. Sometimes when we have happiness, we go out and buy an ice cream. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have ice cream, but praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. In the New Living Translation of the Bible, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 15 and 11, and yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. That's us. Praise Him, all you people of the earth. The gospel has gone forth from Judea into Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And we're right on the opposite side of the globe, right? So we're, <laughs> we're part of this. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise Him, all you peoples of the earth. When we praise the Lord, we focus our attention and our affections on Him. And praise goes hand in hand with worship. I praise Him because I see every blessing on earth as coming from His hand. Every blessing in my family as a gift from Him. And each trial that I face as the possibility of Him working all things together for good. He opened my blinded eyes, eyes that were clouded with sin. Praise the Lord. He healed me by the stripes He took on His back for my deliverance. Praise the Lord. He set me free, loosing the shackles and chains of sin which were dragging me down to the pits of hell, the pit of hell. Praise the Lord. He gave me grace so richly and freely at such a tremendous cost to Himself in order to save me and to make me at one with Him. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. He cares for my mental and my spiritual health, lifting anxieties from my shoulders and healing my brokenness. No matter what circumstances face me, I put my hope in His unfailing love. He meets all of my needs, and sometimes He even gives me things that I, that I appreciate and want. When I'm happy, I will praise the Lord because He is the one who is the giver of all good things. He is the creator of all things. He is my heavenly daddy. It's Father's Day. Praise the Lord. He's my heavenly daddy, and he's worthy of my praise. Lord Jesus, we praise you today. With our hearts and our songs, we praise you for your faithfulness, O oh God. We praise you for your great power and your love. We confess our need for you, O oh God. Our lives don't go so well when we just spin it around on our own. Lord, help us. We struggle on our own strength, and we worry, and we get weary and more. Yet, Lord, you never leave us. You never forsake us. You're with us even unto the very end of the age. Father, we ask you. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, to draw us close to yourself and to work out your purposes through us as we set our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. So James talks about prayer and he talks about praise. And now James moves on to verse 14 and he returns to uh, the theme of a very specific prayer. James writes in verse 14 to verse 18, Is any among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. May God bless the reading of that passage. Another great quality of the church that James found himself being a pastor of was that it was a healing church. People who were struggling with physical illnesses were instructed to call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. 
This was done in Jewish tradition, by the way. In, in Jewish tradition, before you'd ever go seek the counsel of a physician, you would first of all go to the rabbi and have him pray over you. That was pray over you for God to touch you and heal you. Now in the New Testament, men from the congregation of believers were appointed to be elders or overseers as leaders in God's church. And elders fulfilled the role of being shepherds over God's flock. It was a divine appointment. Paul and the first Christians applauded the desire for eldership by creating a popular Christian saying, which is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1. Here is a trustworthy saying, Paul said, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. A genuine desire to lead the family of God is always a Holy Spirit-generated desire. If God has put it in your heart to be an elder or overseer, it is, it is not just you in your mind that are aspiring to do that. And if you are, you're not in the right place. But if you are called to be an elder, God will put it on your heart. The Holy Spirit will put it on your heart. In the book of Acts 20:28, 20, we read that Paul reminded the Ephesian elders that it was the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, not the church nor the apostles, who placed them as overseers and managers of the church to shepherd God's flock. Paul told the Ephesian elders, he said this, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. It was the Holy Spirit who planted the pastoral desire in their hearts. It was the Holy Spirit who gave them the compulsion and strength to do God's work and the wisdom to carry it out with appropriate gifts to care for the flock. And this is why those among us who are physically ill are called by James to go to the elders and ask them to pray over them and anoint them with oil. The shepherds or overseers of the church are representatives of Christ. The oil that they were to use to anoint the sick represented the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. Oil in Judaism was used to symbolize the consecration of people or things for God's use. Now, there have been church leaders over the centuries that believe that this prayer for healing that was spoken of by James was restricted to the apostolic age. They believed that this was something that was evident in the past, but is no longer something that happens now since we've received the written word of God. But I would like to draw your attention to this fact. While the ministry of the apostles was foundational to the building of the church. The entire church structure is built upon Christ himself, the apostles and prophets that came before us. That's the foundation of the church. The apostolic ministry was a foundational ministry in the first century. But the appointment of elders to manage the affairs of the church was not solely a first century office, as was the foundational office of apostle. Overseers or elders were called to shepherd the flock of Christ throughout the ages. As such, the prayer offered to a sick person's recovery was to be done by the elders in the name of Jesus. And because that physician continues it was meant to be permanently practiced in the churches. Now concerning the prayer itself, James says that if the, the prayer for the sick person was offered in faith by the elders who anointed the sick person with oil, it would make the sick person well. Man, I have seen incredible things in my days. I haven't been around very long. I've seen God heal people. 
I have been healed. As a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, I could barely get off the stage because my back was so wrecked. And a brother came up to me and prayed with me, and I got healed instantly. Healing, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God in his sovereignty can touch us. He can heal us. Now, I want to talk about this for a bit because there has been some teaching that has gone out into the church community, community over the centuries that I believe has taken this principle in the wrong direction. And the reason why I say principle, the question has to be asked. Was what James writing was writing here in chapter 5 a blanket statement of fact to be seen in every scenario if faith is present? Or is it a principle laid down, a principle that God desired his people to follow? We need to deal with this question of whether or not it's God's promise to heal a person every time a prayer of faith is offered by an elder of the church. Is James 5.14 a promise? Or is it a principle given by God for us to practice, to follow? If this scripture verse is to be viewed as a promise, then we have a problem. Let me explain. The truth is that most prayers offered to see healing occurred in the case of sick people are not granted. I prayed with our sister Sheila Waite that God would preserve her life if that was his will. But it was God's time to take her. You see, is there a problem with faith and believing in God for healing in this generation? Yes, there is. A huge problem. Sometimes there is. And the scripture says that a double-minded man should not think that he would receive anything from the Lord. Double-mindedness keeps people from being healed. It's true. God will not grant the requests of a double-minded man or woman when they pray. He will not. If you're double-minded in your approach to the Lord, your prayers He's not going to say yes. This is in Scripture. But does the prayer of faith in the power of Jesus' name bring healing even today? Absolutely. Yes, it does. I've been the recipient of it. Maybe you've been the recipient of it or you've seen it. Maybe some of you haven't. But the scripture makes it very plain that it is very real. Yes, Jesus brings healing. There's plenty of New Testament examples of physical healings occurring when the prayer of faith has been offered. It's written all over the New Testament. And you hear testimony of it all over the place today. We don't see it very often in North America, not like some countries in the world. But we do see it. Now, does sin play a part in some sicknesses? Think about that for a second. Does sin play a part in, in some sicknesses? Absolutely, it does. The scriptures say it. As a matter of fact, if you, if you take communion in an unworthy manner, not recognizing the body and broken body and blood of Christ, you may just find yourself getting sick or even passing away. That's how serious it is. Yes, sin can play a part in some sicknesses. Does it always? No, Jesus, you know, the, 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 the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were asking Jesus why this person that he ended up healing was, that, was born that, why did, was there some sin in his life? Or in his, and Jesus was like, this isn't about sin in his life. This person is the way they are because God 
is going to use this to glorify himself. So, Christians can become sick because of issues of sin in their lives, for sure. With all that being said, however, Paul the Apostle had a thorn in his flesh that was not taken away from him even when he asked. The thorn in his flesh was permitted to trouble him because it kept him humble before God. Paul acknowledged that God's grace was, was sufficient for him. He acknowledged it because God, that's what God told him. My grace is sufficient for you for my strength is perfected in your weakness. Now, some would argue, well, this may be not talking about a physical ailment. Maybe it was something else. It's true. We don't know exactly what his ailment was. But the way it, it's, it's written, it very well could have been a physical issue. But further on, in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul told his apprentice, Timothy, he said this, Stop drinking water only and use a little wine because your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Paul also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Tropimus sick in Miletus. These are two examples of where someone was ministering in the early church and had some form of malady. malady some form of illness. Did the apostle Paul not pray for Trophimus or Timothy that they would be healed? If so, did Paul lack the faith as an overseer of those people to see Timothy or Trophimus healed? These are questions that we need to ask because they're written in Scripture. And all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for what? Teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. Well, pastor, doesn't this Scripture in James here teach us that God heals absolutely every person every time prayer is offered in faith? In context with what is being said here, the answer is no. No. I believe James is laying out a principle to be followed, not a promise to be claimed. There were people in the New Testament that were raised from the dead by Jesus, but also by, by the apostles. Did they pray for everybody to be raised from the dead? No. What made them pray for that person to be raised from the dead. It was divine revelation that it was the will of God for that person to be raised from the dead. And I put it to you that God reveals when he wants to heal someone. We don't claim a healing, folks. We don't claim anything. It is not ours to claim. God is sovereign. We are not. When we start claiming things, we make ourselves God. We're saying, I am, and whatever I do, if I just do it from a different angle, I will get what I want. That's indirectly what we're saying. We don't claim healing. It's not ours to claim. It is a gift of God. And the gift of healing is given to different people at different times for God's purposes. And it's still active today, very much. The principle we follow is in line with the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. When we approach the elders of the church and ask us to anoint them with oil and pray for healing, we're following a principle of faith where we trust God to heal us. We recognize that His sovereignty is over us and that it is only He that can bring supernatural healing to us. It is a principle that we turn to Jesus before anything else, before anyone else. Before we go see the doctors, we should be going to see the Lord on our knees and before the elders of the church. This needs to be a practice that needs to be rebirthed in some cases. Instead, we're far too apt just to run to the doctors without even inquiring of the Lord. We should be inquiring of the Lord, folks, because our Jesus is a mighty healer. 
He is. There's an unspoken caveat within this verse. James does not make this statement as if to say, if we do something right, God will give us what we desire. Does God heal? Yes, he does. My friends, sometimes God says, no, that's not my plan for you. In accordance with his sovereign will, we don't always see the end from the, from the, from the place we're sitting, right? We can't. We're not omniscient, but he is. We don't understand the end from the beginning like he does, but he does. So we turn to him and we say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, take this body of yours and do what you will with it. If you would like to, to, to use my physical body to glorify yourself and build your kingdom, do it, Lord. If my suffering, Lord, causes people to, to be built up and your kingdom to be established and I can encourage people through the suffering that I'm going through and the attitude of Christ through that, so be it, Lord. It's not about me. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. When we're Christians, we become servants. It's not the other way around. God isn't here to serve us. We're here to serve Him. When we serve Christ, He will meet all of our needs according to His riches and glory. There is not a single need that He's going to leave us without. Now, does that mean we're going to be rich? No, it doesn't mean that. He's going to give us the grace with whatever things He puts in our path to go through whatever we need to go through, whatever He calls us to go through. James gives us the example of Elijah, a man like you and I, yet he was a man that trusted in God. He prayed for rain not to fall on the earth, and God granted it. God planned through the drought that came to prepare. You, you know why the drought came? If you read 1 Kings and look at this passage of Scripture, the drought came because God planned on confronting the prophets of Baal, the prophets of a false god. Because you recall on Mount Carmel sometime later, Elijah had this challenge that the Lord gave him to challenge the prophets of Baal. Let's see who is God. And they cried and they screamed and they cut themselves and they did all kinds of things to try and get their God's attention. Their God is not God at all. They were worshiping a demon. He didn't answer their prayer. There was no fire from heaven. God saw to it that when Elijah prayed, he said, dump more water on. Build a trench around it. Fill the trench. Dump the water. We're talking drought here. Everything's bone dry. Everyone's dying of thirst. And they're pouring barrels of water on this, on this altar, filling the trenches. Instantaneously, Elijah prayed and fire fell from the heaven and consumed everything, including all of the water. Why? Because he is God. And God had Elijah speak this prophetic word to these people because they needed to see something about who was God and who wasn't. You see, it was God that put Elijah up to this. It wasn't Elijah that put himself up to this. He didn't just go, I think it's a good idea that we're going to challenge the prophets of Baal. That's not how it went. Elijah feared the Lord and he was close to him. And he heard the voice of God and he knew that he was supposed to do this. He knew that he was supposed to prophesy. Prophecy doesn't come from the person. It comes from the Lord. When he prophesied, it was God speaking. And when God showed him that it was time for him to pray, that after the, the Mount Carmel thing and the prophets of Baal were dealt with, now it was time for rain. So he told Ahab, prepare yourself, you know, it's going to rain. Clouds formed and sure enough it rained. Elijah was a man like you and I. He was called of God. He was a gift. He had a gift that God gave him. He had, a, he had a ministry that God gave him in this time. You see, his faith was in line. The reason why things happened is, is Elijah's faith was in line with God's plan. It wasn't Elijah just stepping out and, and claiming, I'm going to claim this. He was in total sync and harmony with what God has had planned. There's people among us today who are giants of the faith, who, 
who are examples of godliness to us. People like, you guys have heard, the older people know Joni Tata Erickson, the lady who had been paralyzed, and her testimony. Many of you know this. She impacted so many people for the Lord in her disability. She asked for healing, and God said, no, I've got a different plan for you. There's people like Nick Wojcik, who had to sojourn through life through extreme disabilities caused by disease. He was born without arms and legs, this man. And, and Nick Wojcik is a messenger of the gospel. The, the ministry of Nick Wojcik has seen over 200,000 first-time decisions for Jesus Christ. This is a man with no arms and no legs. He's got a little flipper for a feet, for a foot. Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians as jars of clay, broken pottery. All of us, from the time we're born to the time we go to meet our Savior, we're in a process of breaking down. We build up, and then we go over the hill, and we break down. You weren't meant to be permanent in this body. Our permanent home will be in a place where there will be no suffering. There will be no, no, no more death. Your perishable, bo perishable body will be washed away and now you'll be given an imperishable body, an imperishable body that will never spoil or fade. Amen? So, in closing my sermon, I, I wanted to show you a clip from Nick Wojcik. So, we're going to play that right now. And this God is will use the foolish Nick Wojcik. God will use the foolish things to confound the wise. God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet. To prove that it's not about Nick. It's not about his ability. It's not about him and his strength and how, how he speaks all around the world and uses his hands greatly as gestures and body language while he gets excited preaching. It's not about me, it's about Jesus. I didn't write my story, Jesus wrote my story. He knew me before the earth began. And I don't know about you, but yeah, it's good to have a job. It's good to have a relationship and get married and have kids. It's good to have that stuff. But until you find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there will be always something missing. You can't rely on you because you will fail you every single time, just about. I needed Him, not just because of this, but for my heart, for my mind. By the grace of God, He kept me here on earth, even though I tried to commit suicide at age 10. The bullying at my school convinced me that I was a mistake that I'd never eventuate to anything. Man, what a lie. When you realize it's just the devil, I say just the devil because the devil's nothing compared to Jesus. I was listening to the encouragement my parents were saying, but then listening to the lies at the same time, the lies saying, you're not good enough, Nick, just give up. No, I am wonderfully and fearfully made according to Psalm 139. Oh, Nick, you should just give up. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At age 10, I didn't believe the truth because I wasn't running the race. I wasn't in the right race. The race where it's not just getting things in your life and doing things and having things. What happens after you get married? You think you're the happiest person alive. You need to talk to some married people first. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right, so then after you get married, and I love my wife, trust me. But if you're not happy single in Jesus, then you're not going to be happy married. Amen? Amen? It's not about me. It's not about my ability. It's not anything about that. It's all about Jesus. It's not about what you have or what you don't have, or what you wish you had or what you wish you didn't have. It's all about Jesus, that no matter where you are in your life right now, if you ask God to forgive you of your sin and you repent of your sin, God will come into your life, forgive you of your sin. You'll receive His life, His blessings, His life eternal, 
and His life, life's plan for your life. Not my plan, I don't want my plan. Sometimes we just need to get over ourselves and actually realize that sometimes God actually has a better plan. I suggest a plan to God and He doesn't say anything sometimes. But we gotta understand that God's ways are higher than ours and thoughts are higher than ours. And I showed that video for, for the summary of my testimony. And I want you to know in your life, I don't know what you're going through, but God does. If I have Jesus, I have everything I need. Now, does that mean I, I don't have a pair of shoes in my closet just in case he says yes to me? No, I do have a pair, okay? Just in case, okay? I wanna be ready. But what we need healing first is in the inside and to hear the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God, when you hear a phone ring, you pick it up, okay? When you're sometimes dialing into heaven and it feels like He's not picking up, don't hang up on God, He's listening. I hung up on God because I didn't understand His plan. God said through my parents, Nick, God's got a plan for your life. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I have a whole plan in the future. I'm like, no way, there's no race like that. There's no heaven, there's no God. Look at all the pain in the world. If God loved the world, then why is He letting so much pain happen? Later on, you realize in the Bible, God doesn't give us pain, but whatever the enemy tried to use for bad, God turned into good. I can't do anything with my broken pieces, but there's nothing that God cannot do. I've seen pain. I've seen miracles. God allows things that we don't understand, but I want you to know if you hold on to Him, He'll hold on to you. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, even when you cannot walk, He'll carry you. When you don't get a miracle, you can still be a miracle. I don't need what the world can give me. I want what Jesus wants to give me. What do you think I rather want? One more person to live forever or have a little bit more money? What do you take with you? Nothing. Nothing. Not your garden, not your car, not your nothing. Just you, your soul. And the encouragement you've planted all around you hopefully souls to come with you. I can only imagine. Now, don't, don't handcuff me because of my doctrine, but I just like this illustration. Imagine God sees me and He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome home. And then He sort of looks over my shoulder and says, who'd you bring? Amen? I want to run that race, the race that matters, the race that counts. And I'd rather be paralyzed in the arms of Jesus in that race than be the first prize winner and runner in any other race. Amen. So my friends, God has a plan. This plan may include physical healing for you if it accomplishes its purpose. So we should ask, is there someone here today that needs prayer? Come, be anointed in the name of Jesus. And if God desires for you to be healed, you will. This is the principle that the Lord wants us to use as guidance. But if you do pray for physical healing and God says no, remember, that like Nick Wojcik, God has a greater plan for you. Faith is trusting in God for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Paul ends, and it's really interesting how he ends after speaking about all this. If you look at verse 19 and 20, he ends it with this. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You see? Because everything is about Jesus. And for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. 
the Son of God, did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen? You have a mission. Your life belongs to Christ. If you're a believer here today, if you're not a believer and you're listening on the, on the internet, or if you're here today and you've never submitted your heart to Jesus Christ, today is the day where you could start a new chapter. The Lord is in the specialty of saving, delivering, and healing. So today could be a day that you will remember for all of eternity. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. Amen. I ask the musicians to come. And as they come and close in a final song, if you would like prayer, I would ask you to come forward here. And <laughs> if you want just to ask the Lord for his purposes to be fulfilled in your life, whether it's you want physical healing, or maybe you just want to rededicate your life to Christ, or maybe you've never even given your heart to the Lord before. Today is the day. May God's grace and peace rest on you. Amen. Let us pray before we close in song. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises, and we thank you for the principles you ask us to live by. God, you are great. Your name is worthy to be praised. Lord, you touch your people. You heal your people. You restore your people. You break the chains of sin on our hearts. You give us eternal life, hope, and a purpose. You fill us with your Holy Spirit. How great are you, O oh Lord, greatly to be praised. Thank you, God, for this day. God, we just pray that as we go, Lord, that we'd remember who you are, that we'd submit our ways to you, that we'd bow the knee of our heart to you, as we venture forward into this next week. We pray that you would be glorified both now in this time and forevermore in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen.